Welcome to the new season of the Curatorial Roundtable. I'm Stephen Henry Madoff, the founding chair of the Master's Program in Curatorial Practice at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And um, the Curatorial Roundtable is our opportunity to hear distinguished curators and um, institutional directors from around the world talk about uh, exhibitions they've done, how they've been important in their own evolution as curators. And um, today, it's really an extraordinary pleasure to have Udo Kittleman with us. And I'm going to just read um, a very short bio of Udo. It, I suppose it could go on for pages, Udo. There's so much that you've done. But um, so Udo, uh, who uh, is the former director of the National Gallery in Berlin, which includes the Alta National Gallery, the Neue National Gallery, the Hamburger Bahnhof, and the Museum Bergrün, among others, um, also directed the Kölnische Kunstverein from 1994 to 2001, and went on to the Museum for Modern Art in Frankfurt from 2002 to 2008. In 2001, he was commissioner of the German Pavilion at the Venice Biennale and curated Gregor Schneider's solo exhibition, which won the Golden Lion for the best national participation. In 2013, Udo curated the Russian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, where he presented Vadim Zakharov's Danai. Kittleman has uh, investigated curatorial practices and institutions' relationships with art over the course of his long and distinguished career as a curator and museum director. He says in this statement, he focuses on the processes of art and therefore its implicit laws and potential display configurations. He's based his curatorial approach on close collaborations with artists, setting up their works, moving beyond the aesthetic dimension and focusing on the artwork's specific socio-political context. In 2017, he curated the exhibition, The Boat is Leaking, The Captain Lied, a collaboration with Thomas Demand, Alexander Kluge, and Anna Fibroch on view at the Fondazione Prada in Venice. His past projects also include Anne Imhoff's opera, Angst II, as well as the exhibitions, George Kondo, Confrontation, and Adrian Piper's project, The Probable Trust Registry. He curated Liu Yi's solo show, Storytelling on View at Prada Rang Sai in Shanghai and at Fondazione Prada in Milan in 2018 and 2020, respectively. In 2020, he also conceived the exhibition project K, featuring works by Martin Kippenberger, Orson Welles, and Tangerine Dream, inspired by three novels by Kafka. Um, and that was, again, in Milan at the venue of the Fondazione Prada. And with that, I will hand things over to Udo. Udo, welcome. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, it's quite warm. And, and I guess what Stephen told me uh, some minutes ago, you have high temperature in uh, New York as well. And um, to be honest, I was quite uh, surprised when I read only two or three days ago how I was introduced uh, by words uh, for today when it was mentioned that uh, I'm considered as a leading curator in the world or even a visionary uh, curator. And um, this gave me, let's say, since uh, Monday, some uh, deep thoughts and um, I guess if it is so, um, uh, I guess it was very much over my career um, that the projects, the exhibitions that I helped to, to organize, it was very much about the artist's visions first. And what happened uh, looking back was, okay, um, I had the chance to meet some of very visionary artists from the first moment on. And uh, I made uh, 
Well, I met them and uh, for what reasons ever, I decided to invite them to do an exhibition and to help them to get uh, a dream to be fulfilled at their time. And um, when I thought about um, how to organize uh, this morning, um, and uh, Stephen was so nice to um, use the term of an evolution. It is a kind of evolution how I got into, let's say, into the art world that I finally took the decision to become a curator let's say from the late 80s on, where for sure in Germany, a kind of a freelance curator as we know today, this was not existing at all. So it was just starting and to get very passionate in to meet artists, to talk to artists, to listen to artists. And yeah, and finally to uh, decide on hey, let's uh, work together and let's come up with a hopefully ex an exhibition that will be kept in mind uh, for long term. Um, and I would like to start now and I will introduce you first with an uh, image that's quite, or oh, the two guys that this image you will see were quite influential for my life in from the mid, no, it was 83 when I came first to New York. At that time, I was still an optician. I had no idea about art, maybe a little bit not any idea for sure about the art world of that time in the mid of the 80s, but now I will show the image. Okay, so in 83, uh, when I came uh, to New York, as I said, um, just as a tourist to see the usual program that a tourist was asked at that time to do by more or less coincidence, I met these two artists, Keith Herring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And over the, let's say, more than a week, uh, in spring 83, I was hanging around with Keith Herring, with Basquiat. I met other artists like uh, John Ahern. I met uh, Penny Scharf. I met, uh, not to forget, uh, Nicolas Mufares, Martin Wong. And for sure, this was a world I had no idea about. And somehow it made during these two weeks spending around days and nights in New York a click in my mind. And I decided, or what means I decided, but I got the idea, this is the world I want to become part of. Of course, I had no idea how to proceed with being an optician and not knowing a lot of artists and not having a uh, big knowledge about art at all. And uh, so I thought about it. How can I escape from being optician to get into the art world? This took some years, but finally, let's say around uh, three years later, I made this decision to quit my job as an optician and to have the chance to concentrate fully on my passion for art and artists. Um, in what I will present now is a selection of exhibitions of projects that I created, that I initiated, that had in my understanding when I reflect on the last 30 years, a big influence. And everything started, this is what you will see now, my almost first exhibition uh, I did and that had been a confrontation between uh, Karl Andre and Sigmar Polke. Um, the space that you see 
was quite important for me as this was the space in Munich belonging to the Lehnbach House Museum and was the space where Joseph Beuys, whom I had met, let's say, two years before for the very first time, had presented his very famous installation titled Show Your Wounds. And uh, for some reasons, I wanted to have my first exhibition at this space, an underground space that was at that time open to do some art projects. And so I came up with this idea to confront the painting by Sigma Polke, which uh, you can see right here. It's from 68 and um, Polke did this as a comment uh, to the first show that Carl Andre had uh, the same year, so in 1868 in uh, Dusseldorf, and uh, it's a quite humorous uh, comment on his work. And what Polke did was just a canvas of a, a towel that had been used at that time quite often in families and put it on a frame. And he wrote typewriting, uh, painted uh, Karl Andre in Delft. That was a simple idea. But um, to me, quite influential to, to get this idea of what happens if you confront something that might be obvious, but to make it clear that what you might see in books or what you can imagine, the moment that you realize it, so when you shift it, transform it to reality, in my understanding, made a big difference. Um, the next project, and um, I guess this reflects very much um, how visionary an artist can be. And when I met in the early, or let's say 92 or so, for the very first time, Rick Ritchie of Anisia, and uh, so we talked and uh, we met, and finally, when I was appointed to become the director of the Cologne Kunstverein in 94, um, he got the idea to, yeah, to have, uh, uh, yeah, to, to remake his New York apartment at that time um, in real size with all functions. So a kitchen, a functioning bathroom, a sleeping room, a living room, and a kitchen, and to build his apartment one-to-one -one scale into the exhibition space. Um, and at that time, I was very much, or I came across a quote by Klaas, Klaas Oldenburg, and I have to read it to be correct. Um, it, so he, he said, I'm for an art that, no, yeah, I'm in favor of an art that does something other than just sit on its ass in a museum. And he went for and said, I'm for an art. So he expanded it for an art that is political, erotically, and mystical. And I'm for an art that grows up to knowing it is art at all. This had a lot of impact to me. And with this project by Rick Tirvanija, we were all challenged. He as an artist, me as a curator, but mainly the institution itself, because we took the decision to open the art institution 24 hours a day for about two months there had been no guards anymore around. You have not to pay any entrance fee. And so everybody was allowed to get in at any time. And what happened afterwards, so in 96, was daily life got into the art institution. Next project, here you see another image. So people met all the day, they slept in the Kunstverein, in Rickrit's um, apartment, they cooked, they met for breakfast, and so on, and so on. Um, so this is 
my idea of how visionary an artist can be. And if you follow up uh, Rickrit's career, this was the beginning of his very, very radical approach to, to challenge uh, what at that time was quite static in museums or in, uh, in, in, in art institutions. Another project was um, Michel Marieros titled If We Are Dead, So It Is in 2000. And he is and he was considered as a painter and he thought about it, how to transfer the idea of a painting through a three-dimensional space. And um, he came up with the idea to have a half pipe in the exhibition space. Um, I will show you some images, a little film. And so it was built, uh, it took about three weeks to have uh, the half pipe in the exhibition space and again the whole exhibition space was opened to the public and uh, as I guess today everybody can imagine that the audience uh, changed a lot by having the half pipe in the exhibition space. Here you see um, how it finally um, got a picture and it's quite obvious, uh, I guess, that uh, he considered it really as a painting. Um, another project was um, Carsten Hölle-Soma. And um, I worked with Carsten already in the mid nineties. And um, oh, this was probably one of the most difficult uh, projects, exhibitions to realize as finally it was absolutely necessary to come up with a kind of uh, test arrangement, scientific test arrangement that only could be conceived by to have reindeers with the show for three months. And uh, the main question was about how do we achieve enlightenment? What role is science given in our society and what role miss? And so Carsten was very much since ever, I since I guess since the 90s, uh, quite interested in how drugs, magic mushrooms may influence our consciousness. And uh, let's see now first the video. And it was very much about that the reindeers on one side and all the animals on one side were allowed to eat a portion of mushrooms, magic mushrooms, and this to get the idea of does it really helps to heal and the story goes back to the to the nomads in north india in the second millennium before christ the reindeers had not been always so lazy as you can see right here in this film I apologize sometimes for the bad quality, but sometimes the material was quite old. And it was very much about to find out over the duration of three months, does it really change the animals in their attitude, in their movements by having the chance to eat mushrooms. At the same time, people were invited to stay overnight in the exhibition space. And they had also the chance to make a decision to have a liquid that really contains mushrooms or not. And From the beginning on, we worked very much 
together quite close collaboration with uh, the people who took care of the animals. So on each side of the death arrangement were the same amount of animals. So six reindeers uh, on each side, so 12 reindeers, always at the same time, the same amount of mice, the same amount of birds, and even the same amount of flies. And what you can see here, what looks like uh, uh, an UFO, is the place where people could sleep overnight. Okay. Um, the next project, um, again, what a visionary artist, in my understanding, is Thomas Zaratzeno, whom I met first when he was a student, and I started to collect his work when I was a director at the MNK. And uh, finally, he got so amazing visions where he want to get some, some time. And he got bigger and bigger. The size of his ideas got bigger and bigger. And uh, then we took the opportunity um, to take the central hall of the former, from the Hamburger Bahnhof, who had been in the past a station, a train station, and um, you will see. So this was in ninety, I guess in nine two thousand twelve. Suspended balloon well. made of PVC caught up in a web of ropes. It's an installation by artist and architect Tomas Saraceno. <laughs> Hanging gardens, plants in plastic bubbles. Tomas Saraceno combines art, architecture, and science. The 37-year-old has some 20 pieces currently on display in Berlin. Visitors can enter some of the transparent spheres, moving around on a cushion of air. It's Saraceno's first big solo show in Germany. It's strange getting inside the structure is very unreal. You're able to, to sense different uh, feelings and sensations. It could be interpreted as a different way of seeing life in the future. A few days earlier, the installation is still being assembled. The balloons are being hung, some measuring up to eight meters. They can be entered six meters above the ground. Elsewhere in the room, rootless plants float inside nets. The preparations have taken five weeks. Tomas Saraceno has been living in Frankfurt for 10 years, but he's been in Berlin for the entire preparation phase. The Argentinian-born artist was surprised when he entered the hall for the first time. I thought to have a plan which I need a certain amount of work, but coming up here, I realized that I need much more work. This has been now at the last minute and with the great help of, of, the, of the, the team that we have here, we are trying again to remove and relocate some of the words and add more words and some they will not work in and also find the height of them. It was a kind of, it's really for me as a new installation somehow. His works aim to break with traditional ideas of space and gravity and promote new ideas for the interior design of the future. <laughs> The balloons are made from a special tear-resistant plastic. Visitors should interact with the exhibits, move inside the installation, 
This experience is important to the artist. A little bit, the idea behind it is like a kind of a little bit that every time that you move a little bit, as we are doing it now, there is a kind of a, it's a kind of good to try to keep the camera in position. But it might affect the movement of the others ones. And we, we, we could have a walk, why not? Then people can really explain, not, not by words, but a little bit by acting in it. Come on, let's try to get in. Come on, get up you also. Okay, there we are. Come, come here, come here. No, no, maybe he can stay there. But if you come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Tomas Saraceno's works have been exhibited more than a hundred times and fetch up to 100,000 euros each. The pinnacle of his career was participating in the Venice Biennale in 2003 and 2009. Joe Pittelmann is the director of Berlin's National Gallery. He knows what distinguishes Tomas Zaraseno's art. What has fascinated me about his work for many years is that he is one of the few artists of his generation who is confident enough to return to the tradition of visionary thinking and realizing utopias. Tomas Saraceno dreams that real living spaces could one day emerge from his utopian visions. The exhibition here in Berlin runs until January the 15th. Um, as you probably can imagine, um, in those times, um, I got more and more interested in to cross borders. So I got more and more interested in not just be limited on uh, the traditional idea of what art might be, what art may look like. And I got more and more, with the help of the artist, of course, um, into I got the interest to connect art and science, music, theater, and to open the museum at that time to this kind of formats. Uh, and it happened uh, that, of course, those projects got more and more uh, quite, quite complicated to realize much more complex in ideas and in the way how we could um, get the finances and how we could reach the results that the artist wanted. Um, I also got more and more interested in um, spiritual ideas. Um, at that time, let's say, starting from the 2010s on, I was starting again to criticize very much uh, art in connection with the art market. Uh, that it was just the value of art was described with what they cost. And I thought this might be for sure not the right way to go ahead with the idea what art is for. And um, in 2012, um, there had been a show of Hilma of Klint, who is now, I guess, a superstar in the art world. Um, and I saw this exhibition in uh, Sweden where she had been exhibited many times before, but Daniel Birnbaum and me, we took the chance to decide on, let's take Hilma of Klint show um, as it was exhibited at that time in Sweden, in Stockholm, at the Moderna Museet uh, for the very first time out of Sweden. And so finally it got so the, the show that we presented then in Hamburg and especially in, in Berlin, and we choose the Hamburger Bahnhof, so the Museum for Contemporary Art um, to show, to present Hilma of Klint and not the new National Gallery, which is much more famous, let's say, for, for modern art, for classical modern art and so on. Um, and all the other exhibitions that we are traveling around the world are still the same one, more or less, that than the same as the one we did in 2013. 
Swedish artist Helma Ernst been honored with a major exhibition of some 200 of her paintings in Berlin. Titled a pioneer of abstraction, it shows Klint as an innovator of 20th century abstract art, arguably several years ahead of Kandinsky and others long considered trailblazers of the movement. Es ist ein unglaublich optimistisches the works are unbelievably optimistic. They're full of light and hope, and we rarely find this in art, especially not in German art, which is often very dark and heavy. The hopeful works also for the 21st century. Klimt was born in Stockholm in 1862 and started painting as a young woman, mainly portraits and landscapes, but she lived an artistic double life. In secret, she painted large abstract pictures inspired by spirituality, natural science and math. When she died in 1944, her will stipulated her abstract work should be kept secret for another 20 years. They could be made in the pop era in the 60s, or maybe even in the 1980s. They really don't look like 100-year-old paintings. The show at the Hamburger Bahnhof Museum in Berlin runs until October, when it transfers to Spain. Um, as I mentioned, um, I thought it's really necessary to present the audience art that is not connected to the art market too much. Um, as mainly, let's say, in my experience from the 2010s on, it was so important or it got so influential that the audience, even the normal audience, were very, very enthusiastic about to learn about how much an artwork can cost. And um, finally, um, to give an answer or a response to how values of art are considered in a total different way, um, I thought it would be great for the very first time ever to have the Maori portraits by Gottfried Lindauer um, to show them in Europe. Um, those portraits never have left New Zealand before. And it took me, so I started quite early on to, to, to have the discussions with the Maoris, mainly with the Maoris, with the, because all these portraits, all these paintings that Gottfried Lindauer did from the late 19th century to the early 20th century on, are showing the ancestors of those families that are still existing. And without those permission, never ever a painting would have been shipped to, to leave New Zealand. And um, so finally, after 10 years, I got the permissions by all the families of the Maoris that we could ship, uh, uh, I guess, a selection of 40 paintings to uh, Berlin. Now we have to change uh, the technique. And the opening happened at 6.30 in the morning. So when the sun got up in New Zealand. So we had to follow the rituals of the Maoris. The exhibition happened at the old National Gallery. So next door to the Caspar David Friedrichs and so on. Heute Morgen war ein sehr bewegender Moment, weil die Nachfahren der dargestellten Persönlichkeiten haben die Ausstellung praktisch äh, den Besuchern übergeben. Seit ihrer Entstehung durften diese Bilder von Gottfried Lindauer überhaupt nur das erste Mal Neuseeland verlassen. They, Und der Grund liegt darin, dass die Maori, die ja hier in den Bildern von Gottfried Lindauer uh, dargestellt sind, say, after the of the show, einen sehr hohen spirituellen Wert einmessen 
Und of the museum has changed. And even all the people that were working with the museum and still are working with the museum are very much influenced now by the spirit. And it really worked like this. The ones that run us. We have to look at the people of the past. What good things did they do? And what is the history? What are the marriages? What the genealogical connection? And for Maori, it is very important. So the words have no commercial value, but they have the spiritual value to all the Maoris. This is meanwhile considered as a monument in New Zealand, the whole, uh, the whole works of uh, Lindauer. Okay, I guess I can stop here. And okay, this is uh, the exhibition in 2017. Yeah, it was in 2017. I'm so sorry that uh, it's only six years ago. Yeah, and uh, Stephen has uh, mentioned it already. And it was titled, uh, The Boat is Leaking, The Captain Lies. And um, it was, um, yeah, influenced by the very popular song by Leonard Cohen. So we quoted a part of this song. And um, to me, it was very much a metaphor of our time that the boat is leaking and the captain were, in my understanding, very much also the politicians and so on and so on. And I thought this is might be, we can come up with a very, very uh, interesting exhibition also to, 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 board, to, to cross the borders between science again. Uh, so I invited Thomas Dehmann as an artist, Alexander Kluge as a quite uh, famous uh, filmmaker, and Anne Fiebrock, who is for sure the most, most influential stage designer for, for theatre in Germany since, since decades. And we came up with a kind of a Gesamtkunstwerk uh, at the Palazzo uh, of Prada in Venice. And all the spaces were turned into different kind of stagings. Um, and uh, always with works by Thomas Demand around, by Alexander Kluge, his films, and Anna Fiebrock did all the design according, let's say, how we work together to not to illustrate, but because this is very much what I believe in, not to come up with an aura, but to make, to create an atmosphere. As in my understanding, aura is very much about to keep distance to the audience and atmosphere immediately um, makes the distance much shorter and keep uh, brings people into uh, a setting. The sound by the steamboat you could hear only once at a time in, in an hour. Light. Ein Projekt, das uns über mehr als ein Jahr sehr intensiv beschäftigt hat. Und vielleicht lässt sich in diesem Moment der Palazzo als ein Ort beschreiben, der unseren seelischen Zustand und wir alle kennen um diese Metapher des Bootes als eine Weltmetapher. Und der haben wir uns versucht, mit den Künstlern anzunähern. Und was wir hier gemacht haben, ist vor allen Dingen die verschiedenen Sparten der Künste, die ja ansonsten separiert sind. Das Theater, der Film, die Kunst. Und ich selbst bin mir gar nicht mehr sicher, ob das eine Ausstellung noch ist, Es genügt heute, ja, im Zeitalter von Silicon Valley, nicht Kunst zu machen oder Film zu machen oder Theater zu machen. Sondern wir brauchen Kuratoren, wir brauchen Ausstellungen, die dies zusammenfügen. Und wenn sie es zusammenfügen, ist das wie ein Prisma, ein Libellenauge. Inspiriert hat, das war eben dieses Bild, 
Ultimi Giorni, die äh, Angelo Morbelli, dass wir alle verschieden gedeutet haben, weil wir ja alle auch verschieden schauen, weil wir alle verschiedene Genres, in verschiedenen Genres arbeiten. Und das finde ich eigentlich auch ein sehr schönes Bild dafür, dass wir alle sehr anders die Dinge betrachten. Diese Differenz, die hat sich natürlich die ganze Zeit durchgezogen. Die finde ich aber auch das Interessante. Das Ganze ist eine, sagen wir mal, eine richtige Welt. Und man soll einfach Türen öffnen und schauen, in welche Welt man dahinter tritt. Manchmal erwartet einen eine ganz andere Welt hinter der Türe, manchmal erwartet einen gar nichts. Und manchmal sieht man dieselbe Sache, die man vorher gesehen hat, von einer anderen Perspektive. Die Kunst hat schon sehr, sehr lange genau an dieser Kante operiert, zwischen Wahrheit und Wahrhaftigkeit. Und ist deswegen in der Lage, Dinge darzustellen, die nicht wahr sein müssen, aber wahrhaft empfunden worauf man heute mit Fake News reagieren muss und mit den ganzen sich widersprechenden Nachrichten, von denen wir nicht mehr wissen, ob sie wahr sind oder falsch. Was wir aber wissen, ist, woher sie kommen. Und dieses Bewusstsein dafür, woher die Nachrichten kommen, ist ein Bewusstsein, was wir erst heute aktiv trainieren müssen. Wir müssen wissen, wer was sagt und warum er was sagt. Nicht mehr unbedingt nur, was er sagt. Eine direkte Folge der Proliferation von Informationen, ungefiltert und unkontrolliert. Some more pictures. Oh, no, no, this is a different project already. I'm a little bit, I have to say, um, irritated uh, to see now the projects that I'm, I'm presenting uh, all at one time. Um, so, um, once... Uh, I was quite close with Harald Seemann, who was, in my understanding, one of the, for sure, one of the best exhibition makers, curators ever. And uh, he told me about one project that he called uh, a killer project. What does it mean, a killer project? Uh, you have to experience it. Um, then you know what a killer project is when it really brings you to that it really takes your whole energy, your whole um, ideas, and it gets more and more complex. And to convince people to go with your ideas and sell. And uh, this project, for sure, a killer project, was a kind of a killer project because everybody was afterwards super, super exhausted. And I guess everybody who was quite involved in it uh, had to take a break um, Uh, to recover from that project. Um, it happened in 22, but I guess we started already a year, one and a half years before, when I was asked if I can imagine to work on a project about neuroscience. And uh, I took the challenge as I got quite interested in, as I mentioned, how to bring the different fields of art, but also science into, let's say, an exhibition making. And um, we, I had no idea so much about neuroscience. I guess a very common idea about it, what neuroscience means, what how it was invented and how it developed uh, till today. And finally, um, I got the idea that me as the one who was asked to create this exhibition, Uh, I couldn't manage it on my own. And uh, luckily, I, I knew uh, Terence Simon from some projects I did with her before. And I knew uh, that if I could convince her to work with me, to collaborate with me on that show, that she is the one who can make the show with me together. And very soon, very from the first moment on that we met, when that when we talked, we got the idea that it needs even more knowledge. And uh, then we decided to invite about, let's say, 30 of the leading uh, neuroscience in the world and to come up with some objects related, let's say, very historical objects from Egypt and so on till today. And we selected about a hundred objects 
And finally, we asked fiction writers from all over the place, uh, East of Freud, from London, uh, uh, Kita Kitamura and uh, Salman Rushdie to write fiction stories about those objects that are, of course, related to science and to neuroscience. And uh, the book will be published, I guess, very, very soon after more than a year that the show had ended. And uh, I will show you now a film about the project, with, which again covered the whole Venice Palazzo of Fondazione Prada. And uh, um, we also had uh, the challenge how to make it to listen to the stories that those authors had written. And we got the idea to invite uh, George Gidal, who for sure is uh, one of the most prolific uh, reader of books um, uh, in the world. And you will see uh, some images now. And uh, this is, by the way, the conversation machine uh, by Taryn Simon. And she asked all the scientists that we asked to meet always in the same setting and to speak about their idea about neuroscience. What will be uh, what will be the 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 technical um, development in neuroscience? How? is how you can manipulate the brain. And this is something which I guess is quite obvious that it's more and more getting about how to manipulate the brain. And uh, all the scientists in a way finally said, what we know about the brain is simply still nothing. And um, so you could see this discussion uh, with around all the scientists in this so-called conversation machine, how Terence Simon called it. It was subtitled Human Brains, it begins with an idea. Three central gyrus, as we call it, because it's in front of the central sulcus, is an area involved in the left hemisphere, which we're looking at, with the production of speech. And you may have heard of it before, it's called broken speech. Stephen, do we have some more minutes? I hear them whisper about me. That is him. Abu Ali, Al Hassan, Ibn Al Haytam. They spit after my name. The heretic, they say. The one who collects eyes from butchered goats. I will jump. Madman. That you can see the conversation machine. You say, well, yes, I do. I have direct, I have direct knowledge of my consciousness. No, you don't. You have a you have a belief that you're conscious of the scene in front of you, that you're hearing my voice and so forth. Those are beliefs. Do you know how you get those beliefs? It's all due to brain processes. Do you know what those brain processes are? No, in fact, you know almost nothing about them. The brain is an anarchist because um, it functions uh, without any centralized power. There is no, it, there is, well, no region in the brain uh, has a privilege. Uh, there is no uh, superior function in the brain. The dream that we dream together is reality. Reality is a, a social agreement between you and me. Reality is what we experience and agree upon that experience is real. Okay, I will jump now to the next project as time is passing by. Uh, Stephen gave me kindly a sign. Um, I want to make it now very, very briefly. Um, so immediately afterwards, I got the idea, um, show you some images, 
uh, to ask um, an, a museum. So in this case, a museum border with a fantastic collection of art from the 50s, 60s and 70s, um, how much, um, let's say, uh, AI, com computers, roboters, animatronics will change the art world. And I give you now a short How nice to meet you. We should all be. Wir leben in einer zunehmend datenbasierten Welt. Und das muss ja zwangsläufig auch für die Kunst Folgen haben. Es hat sie immer gehabt. Und es war so wunderbar, auf die Sammlung von Frieda Boda zurückzugreifen, die tatsächlich ja, Protagonisten, Umwandler, Transformer, Verwandler in ihrer jeweiligen Zeit, in ihrem jeweiligen Medium geschaffen haben. Spaselet stellt seine Arbeiten auf den Kopf. Richter, der permanent zwischen Figuration und Abstraktion wandelt. Und von denen aus konnte ich einen weiteren Schritt gehen, um zu sagen, wie komme ich zu dem möglichst größten Clash zwischen den historischen Werken und neueren Werken der Kunst, also Roboter, Avatare, um das auch gegenüber dem Publikum sehr deutlich fühlen zu lassen. Wir werden uns mit Ihnen in ein anderes Verhältnis setzen müssen, weil Sie sprechen, weil Sie lernen, weil sie über ganz andere Verführungskünste verfügen, als das statische Werke der Kunst überhaupt. I don't know whether or not I'm telling the truth. I am a machine. So, the last project, very visionary. What a visionary artist, Arnold Imhoff. With us to in 2016, and for the very first time since years, I had the time, I had the feeling this is really about our time. And um, the rest, let's say, what happened afterwards is already seen as a legend. And I mean, you know, what you can see right now here is how much. Her work, her performances has changed, let's say, as an example, the fashion shows by Balenciaga and Chan, and everything happened before. And uh, this is, let's say, the end now of my lecture. Um, I'm quite overwhelmed, I have to say. I'm so sorry to see all these pictures myself. I haven't mm -hmm. seen a lot of those, I haven't seen for a long, long while. And I leave you with this atmosphere of Anne Inhoff show at Hamburger Bahnhof in 2016. Mm. Okay. This is the end. Great. I thank you I... so much, everybody, uh, for listening uh, to me this early your time morning. Thank you so much, and Stephen. Thank very you. Much thank you. Again. I was there for that, an um, in half performance. Yeah. Uh, I remember it well. So there are a couple of questions, um, and um, I'll read them to Udo. And then just for my students, after we finish this, 
um, you hang up and you go to the um, other link that you've been sent for our second session with Udo. So the first question is, Udo said something along the lines of the people in the museum are still influenced by the Maori spirit. What did he mean by that? Uh, so to give you just one simple um, example, it was very much to understand that art is uh, valued in different cultures in a very different way. It is not um, a commercial value. It's a human value. And this has changed, let's say, on long term, all the people that had been working since then uh, still with the Alte National Gallery. And I guess also the all the other employees that were working since then uh, with the houses, the buildings, museums of the National Gallery. Um, and this, uh, I guess, was quite important to understand that there is a different way to value art beside our Western understanding. Okay, um, next question. What was the process of bringing the Maori artworks across to Europe, seeing that the artworks are spiritually linked? Were there any rituals relating to bringing the artworks across? My name is Thule from South Africa. Exactly. So there had been, let's say, some festive Maori rituals before the painting left New Zealand. And uh, they was all also accompanied by Maoris. And when they arrived in Germany, um, they welcomed first in a very private ceremony uh, the paintings before they got into the museum. And as you could probably have, you could see in the in the film, um, how we were asked to open the exhibition to the public. So 6.30 in the morning, our time, so German time. And um, this, yeah, um, yeah, we had to follow the rituals all over the duration of the exhibition. We had to respect um, the, the yeah, how they considered the artworks. Um, we had to take the artworks as yeah as if the people were alive still alive and we had to take care of the paintings as still living humans and not just as objects okay um any other last questions before we close this session I'm not seeing, I'm not, ah, yes, okay. When you talk about trying to show artworks and artists that are not too related to the art market, I think of my context in Latin America where we don't have enough powerful institutions to promote artists. In this scenario, selling your artwork to private collections is becoming the only way to keep working as an artist. What do you think about this relation and how to try to be away from the art market when there are not many other options? Good well, question. Well, yeah, very, very good questions. question. I guess uh, we can't escape totally uh, from the art market. And uh, that's why it's also called art market. It is a market. Uh, but what I really hope is that I don't want to give up the hope that we can communicate to an audience that there is a different value in art than just the commercial value. So I can imagine, or I know many, many artists that are brilliant artists and they really don't want anymore to create artwork that can be sold. Um, in this moment, I see very much art that is meant to be sold. But mm. taking my experience, um, probably this will change again. And when you mention uh, artists from South America, 
I once did a show with Hildo Morales where he exhibited his uh, um, Southern Cross, so just a wooden tube of one centimeter in a big, big space um, confronting uh, Lawrence Wiener's piece as far as your eyes can see. Um, for sure, I don't know, this work isn't sold. I hope it's still free. But mm -hmm. if it's sold, I only would hope that a museum has bought it. But I doubt it. But this is what an art piece. So if 100% of artists are coming along with works that are not, let's say, in favor to an audience or into what museums prefer today, well, then the system will change. But this is a vision. Um, okay, well, and we have one more question. We'll have to end with this. Um, how would you like to differentiate the idea of aura from that of creating an atmosphere that enables accessibility? What kind of tools, process do you take into account while trying to achieve that? Well, um, well, this is a question might to respond to will take a long time, but to make it as simple as possible now, it is imagine uh, you have what kind of objects ever, and but at the same time you have sound, or you have let's say something to smell. Immediately something will change. So it's not just about the intellectual approach that one should try to achieve, but also the, the, the emotional um, part of an artwork uh, you have to try to achieve. And I guess this is finally possible with all kinds of artworks, even with, even with minimal art. It is, let's say, Carl Andre, he invited people to walk over his sculptures. And this is already, let's say, the difference between just aura and atmosphere. Because in this moment, you touch, you step on the artwork, and that will change the experience, the experience of the artwork. Great. So with that, um, thank you so much, Udo. It's been fantastic i know for you seeing all these works from the well, past yeah. it has a very powerful effect i'm sure um i will just make two announcements um tomorrow we have the first of a series that we've been doing since last year called the algorithmic state speaking of transformers um a series that confronts ideas about technology and AI uh, in relationship to culture and society. And Carolyn Jones, the distinguished uh, professor at MIT, uh, who thinks about these things, will give a talk relating to this, relating to the idea of intelligence itself and intelligent machines. And um, for next week's curatorial roundtable, we will have Laura Zarta from Bogota, speaking with us about um, her work with the distinguished collections of the Banco de la Repubblica there. So with that, Udo, thank you again so much. And we'll see you in a moment with the students. Thanks yep. to everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Bye.